So it's treason then. Or at least that's what a lot of people are worried about. People are rightfully upset about the Trump campaign and the Trump administration's attempts to effectively overthrow the results of the 2020 election. So the question is, and I never thought I'd be asking this question, did people commit sedition and treason when they stormed the Capitol on January 6th? And more importantly, did some of our elected politicians actually commit sedition and treason? And if they did, can they be expelled from Congress? Sponsored by Skillshare. Hey Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a national security lawyer and welcome to my new office with one of those incredibly practical outward facing desks. But it does allow me to do this, which adds quite a lot of gravitas to whatever I'm going to say. It's Legal Eagle, now with 7% more gravitas. But today we're talking about sedition and treason. Americans are trying to find the right words to convey just how desperate the Trump administration's efforts are to hold on to power. And they've generally landed on the concepts of treason and sedition, but do they fit? Well, let's start with what is treason. The early Americans were men and women who actually committed treason against the English crown. That's actually how this country was founded. So they were bound to have a pretty limited view of what constituted an offense against the state. In their experience, kings used treason charges to silence their political opponents and to punish their enemies. So they defined treason quite narrowly. Treason is in fact the only crime described in the constitution. Quote, treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. No person shall be convicted of treason unless on the testimony of two witnesses of the same overt act or on confession in open court. This comes from the English definition of treason. In the 14th century, Edward III's judges expanded the common law concept of treason to cover just about anything the king didn't like. For example, if a person went hunting on the king's forest without permission, this was treason rather than trespass. That's a crime, but that probably shouldn't be treason. Therefore, the English aristocracy compelled Edward III to agree to an act of parliament that restricted the definition of treason to a direct offense against the king or his family, such as acts of violence, loving war against England, and giving aid and comfort to the king's enemies in the English realm or elsewhere. And that's where we derive the definition of treason in the US Constitution, either levying war against the United States or adhering to the enemies of the United States and giving them aid and comfort, which repeats an interesting legal principle. The founders were simultaneously disgusted by the monarchy, but also guided by English legal principles, which takes us to the affair of Aaron Burr. There actually haven't been that many prosecutions against politicians for committing treason probably for good reason. But the most prominent politician to be tried for treason against the United States is probably Aaron Burr, former vice president and the man who killed Alexander Hamilton in a duel. After Burr killed Hamilton, the political class basically shunned Burr, but he wasn't willing to wait for it. So Burr reached out to Great Britain to offer his help if they felt like annexing the Western United States. The English royalty more or less ignored Burr, so he went on a recruiting trip to Blennerhassett Island. Think of this as the Mar-a-Lago of the Ohio River, where he got financial backing from a wealthy Irish immigrant. And Burr went to New Orleans and enlisted the help of basically rich guys and ex-politicians. The plot seemed to involve annexing parts of Mexico and Louisiana and convincing other states to secede and start a new country. But Burr wasn't just talking trash. His co-conspirator was General James Wilkinson, basically the Mike Flynn of the 19th century. Wilkinson was the highest ranking general in the army. And like Flynn, Wilkinson was a secret agent for a foreign government, in his case, Spain. But unlike Flynn, uh, nobody knew about Wilkinson's treachery at the time. Wilkinson was still on active duty in command of Western soldiers. But after a year of planning, Wilkinson backed out and alerted President Jefferson. Burr left Blennerhassett Island with fewer than 100 supporters and tried to escape. He was eventually caught and tried for treason. But the trial was America's first trial of the century. Burr was defended by two ex-attorneys general. Just think of them as the Bill Barr and Jeff Sessions of the time. And those lawyers argued that the definition of treason required evidence of an overt act by the defendant in furtherance of levying war against the United States. And Chief Justice Marshall agreed with this interpretation. He ruled that Burr had a First Amendment right to voice his opposition to the government, to the president, and to the very concept of the United States. But Marshall's definition of overt action was very narrow. Quote, there must be an actual assembling of men for the treasonable purpose to constitute a levying of war. In his mind, talk without assembling of men willing to levy war was not actually treason. And there was no question that Burr loved to talk about schemes to take down the US and get back at his political rivals. There was little doubt 
that Burr had rallied with volunteers and businessmen who would back his venture. However, Burr wasn't physically present on Blennerhassett Island when his volunteers gathered with weapons, and Justice Marshall had already told the jury that they couldn't consider any actions of war that occurred outside of Blennerhassett Island. The prosecution could not convince the jury to hold Burr responsible for an overt act taking up arms against America. The jury found him not guilty. Burr's goals were still murky to this day, largely because Burr said different things to different people. On one day, he was trying to colonize part of Louisiana. The next, he was trying to convince Western settlers to revolt against the United States. And the day after that, he was hoping to wrangle Texas away from Spain. And while the elements of treason can include the breach of allegiance, these actions were not unanimously considered treason since plotting against Spain was not exactly a betrayal of allegiance to the United States. And it wasn't entirely clear that encouraging the states to engage in another revolution was illegal in 1805 either. But the Burr prosecution was the exception rather than the rule. There have been fewer than 30 treason charges since the constitution was ratified in 1789. The people who conspired with John Wilkes Booth to kill President Lincoln were charged with traitorous murder and attempted murder. People were charged with treason for defecting to Nazi Germany during World War II or aiding and abetting the Japanese during the same period. So the question is, does anything that President Trump or his surrogates have said or done rise to the level of treason? Well, in a legal sense, almost certainly not. Now, arguably the closest President Trump has ever come to treason would be in arguably collaborating with a foreign government to undermine the United States through interfering with an election. And while welcoming and utilizing uh, the resources of a foreign government in one's own election is a lot of things, it's probably not levying war and it's probably not treason. And with respect to the things that the president and the president's campaign have tried to do with respect to undoing the results of the 2020 election through petitioning the courts, most of what they have done explicitly seeks to use the force of the United States, whether that use of force is legitimate or not. So he isn't levying war against the United States, he's actually advocating for the use of the implements of the United States itself. So no matter how badly you may think he has actually acted in that context, and you'd probably be right that he's acted pretty poorly, again, that's not levying war against the United States. So it's not treason then. But what about sedition? America's second president, John Adams, signed the Sedition Act in 1798. The Sedition Act made it a crime for American citizens to, quote, print, utter, or publish any false, scandalous, or malicious writing about the government. The Sedition Act was pretty obviously unconstitutional because it trampled on the First Amendment right to freedom of speech, but Adams and his Federalist Party went full steam ahead with prosecutions, charging dozens of newspaper editors with sedition. Now, obviously, President Trump would have loved this law since it gave him the ability to jail reporters, which he has many times advocated for. But the Americans of 1800, however, did not love the Sedition Act and punished the Federalists by electing Thomas Jefferson to the presidency. The original Sedition Act expired in 1801 and the crime of sedition has been severely limited in the modern era. Current laws on sedition were passed in 1940. A second sedition law punishes anyone who advocates for the overthrow of the federal government by force. Now, the main distinction between sedition and treason is that treason requires levying or waging war. Sedition can be language or conduct that incites people to destroy or overthrow or attack the government. The Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the sedition laws, but they're construed very narrowly to prohibit the government from attacking purely political speech. As currently interpreted, sedition does not destroy the First Amendment's guarantee of freedom of speech. Like treason, sedition requires actively plotting to take up arms against the United States. Simply talking about it on Parler is not enough. But if the Parler patriots meet up and plot to kill a governor or assassinate an incoming president, they could be charged with sedition. And as the statute is currently interpreted, you actually have to plot to use force against the United States. And proving sedition is harder than you might think. For example, in 2014, a Christian focus group known as the Hutteri held military training exercises in Michigan and amassed lots and lots of weapons. They called themselves Warriors for Jesus and were found in possession of tear gas, night vision goggles, a dagger, a sword, manuals on bomb making, books by Hitler, race war books, and a bunch of guns. The FBI spent a year infiltrating the group and eventually charged them with plotting to kill a police officer and ambush several more officers at a funeral. But a federal judge acquitted all of them because they were engaged in political speech. The judge said that, quote, there was something fishy going on, but since something fishy isn't illegal, the charges were dismissed. The Huttery argued that their training exercises were just some dudes playing with guns in the woods, as one does. 
The judge never bought into the government's case that they were going to actually commit crimes. But some people actually have been prosecuted and convicted of sedition. For example, Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, a blind Egyptian cleric living in New Jersey who is now serving a life sentence in prison. Rahman and nine other men were convicted of seditious conspiracy despite committing no overt acts of war. However, Rahman was found to have encouraged the men to levy war against the United States. The group was arrested while mixing explosives in a garage in Queens. The sedition laws make speech criminal only when the speech constitutes an agreement to use force against the United States. So in case you currently live in Michigan, or let's be honest, Florida, here's how that would play out. You can generally give an opinion that the government should be overthrown even by violence. You can advocate for the forcible overthrow of the government in the abstract, but you can't explicitly encourage or induce someone to overthrow the government by concrete action. And it's not easy to tell when speech plus action crosses these lines. But to be convicted of seditious conspiracy under section 2384, a defendant has to conspire to use force, not just advocate the use of force. So with that background, let's look at some of the things that President Trump and his surrogates have said. All of the beautiful conversations that they've had that were 100% perfect. Well, during the first debate, President Trump said that the right wing Proud Boy group should stand back and stand by. Proud Boy, Proud Boys. Stand back and stand by. Some of the Proud Boys viewed this comment as a call to action, according to extremist researchers. The Proud Boys went on a rampage in DC early in December, clashing with other protesters, resulting in several people being stabbed. Did President Trump act like Sheikh Rahman? No, not quite. Were President Trump's words seditious? Almost certainly not. He was talking in the abstract, and while we may hate that speech, under the First Amendment, we have to live with it, and that's probably the better way. But let's talk about militias. When a group of private citizens gets together to talk about hating the government, and that group is armed, they're often called militias. But it's not illegal to create a social group like this, or even for them to call themselves militias. However, every state makes it illegal for private militias to engage in activities traditionally reserved for authorized state militias. And frankly, states are pretty lax in actually enforcing those laws, which arguably leads to more paranoid people gathering with their guns and declaring themselves as militias. This might be harmless, but the fact that there are prominent people encouraging this kind of activity certainly doesn't help. And the people arrested in Michigan for trying to kidnap the governor were charged with violating Michigan's anti-terrorism statute rather than with sedition. This is probably because sedition's close association with speech makes it really hard to prove. So you start to get the picture. Prosecutors don't even like to charge sedition because there are other statutes that are a better fit and don't have the sort of issues that you run into with the First Amendment. So you can see that charges of sedition are incredibly rare and probably for good reason, often not even being used against things as extreme as an actual militia. So things like uh, filing a bogus lawsuit to overturn an election, uh, not even going to come close to actionable sedition, though there are ways that we might be able to punish meritless lawsuits uh, in different ways. And similarly, challenging the Electoral College results through objections on January 6th is not sedition because Congress people are simply following a constitutional mechanism, or at least what they vehemently and wrongly believe those constitutional mechanisms to be. Now, many of the Capitol rioters are already being charged with seditious conspiracy. This is covered by 18 U.S.C. 2384. The law gives prosecutors a variety of ways to charge these rioters. For example, if two or more people conspire to prevent, hinder, or delay the execution of any law, such as trying to stop Congress from tabulating the Electoral College votes, this could be seditious conspiracy. I've covered this extensively in another video about all the crimes that the Capitol rioters committed. And likewise, if two or more people, quote, seize, take, or possess any property of the United United States, such as, say, stealing mail, computers, gavels, lecterns, and other objects from the Capitol, they could be charged under Section 2384, in addition to being charged with federal theft and vandalism crimes. Now, rioters can argue that they were there to peacefully protest, and loudly expressing one's opinion is protected under the First Amendment, even if a person generally advocates for the use of force. There is a First Amendment right to protest, but there's not a First Amendment right to stop the government from functioning. So if prosecutors can show that they were engaged in action, not just speech, they can probably prove sedition. And there's plenty of evidence of coordination between members of this mob. But what about members of Congress and members of the president's inner circle? Can they face charges for the encouragement and participation of what happened on January 6th? 
Well, the answer is that it both depends and it's complicated, an answer that I'm sure will thrill absolutely everyone. Now, to prove seditious conspiracy, there must be an agreement between two or more people who are working together towards a common goal. But the goal doesn't need to be specifically articulated or explicit. This means that the co-conspirators didn't need to pinky swear that they were going to barge into the Capitol building, steal things, threaten people, and beat up the cops. Individual defendants can tacitly agree to a larger conspiracy if they knew or should have known that others were going to take the same actions, such as storming the Capitol building. And it's worth remembering why rioters stormed the building in the first place. They had the common goal of preventing hindering or delaying Congress's counting and certification of the electoral votes. And it also seems like they wanted to punish Mike Pence and Nancy Pelosi and anyone that they could get their hands on. And while I wouldn't call it overwhelming evidence, there is certainly some evidence of coordination with people fairly high up in the government. For example, President Trump promoted the event and may have even met with the leader of the Proud Boys on December 12th, the day after the Supreme Court dismissed the Texas lawsuit to overturn the election. Enrique Tario, the leader of the Proud Boys, posted on Parlor, last minute invite to an undisclosed location. Wow, I'm in awe. And he was at the entrance to the White House. Tario's second post shows the main portico with the comment, never thought I'd be here. And while the White House said that Tario was just taking a public tour, it didn't provide any proof that Tario followed the rules for White House visits, which require applying at least 21 days in advance and passing a background check. Tario is a convicted felon, and we now know that his group, the Proud Boys, participated in the January 6th attack. And not surprisingly, one of them has been accused of plotting to kill Nancy Pelosi and Mike Pence. And much of what we know about the plot to overthrow the government is from Ali Alexander, a right-wing conspiracy theorist who led one of these Stop the Steal groups. And in a live stream video after the January 6th attack, Alexander said he planned the rally with three GOP representatives, Paul Gosar and Annie Biggs of Arizona and Mo Brooks of Alabama. I was the person who came up with the January 6th idea with Congressman Gosar, Congressman Mo Brooks, and then Congressman Andy Biggs. And this wasn't something that Alexander came up with after the fact. The Intercept reported that Alexander claimed to be working with members of Congress three times before the rally happened on December 21st, 28th, and 29th. Now, remember that because we'll get back to that in just a second, but let's talk about the element of force. Seditious conspiracy requires that co-conspirators plan to effectuate their illegal ends by some unlawful means. Co-conspirators need to have considered the use of force, even though the ultimate goal need not actually use force. And the element of force does not necessarily mean engaging in explicitly violent activities. The government can prove this element if the co-conspirators contemplated the unlawful invasion of rights of others. And in media appearances before the event, Alexander raised the stakes and predicted violence. He first asserted that if Biden's win was certified, there would be slavery, concentration camps, serfdom, and death. If you do not stand up and fight now, you are signing your road and your ticket to serfdom. Alexander was very clear about what he intended to do on January 6th to stop this from happening. Quote, everyone can guess what me and 500,000 others will do to that building. 1776 is always an option. And on January 5th, Alexander led Trump supporters in a peaceful rally on Freedom Plaza, where he shouted, Victory or death? Victory Alexander's claims sound far-fetched, but there are many links between Alexander and prominent Republicans. The Arizona Republican Party endorsed a message from Alexander that he was willing to die for Donald Trump, saying, are you, it asked of supporters. So let's come back to the Three Stooges, starting with Paul Gosar. Arizona Rep Gosar did not say anything to contradict the official Arizona position on dying for Donald Trump. Gosar was in close contact with Alexander, though, and according to Alexander, Gosar helped him raise money for various rallies. Gosar confirmed Alexander's claim that he helped organize the rallies. Quote, I helped organize the very first Stop the Steal rally in Arizona. Patriotic warriors joined together to gather evidence and tell the left that we will not accept a coup and a usurper in the White House. He spent basically all of December railing against the election result and appearing with Alexander at rallies. In an opinion piece published on December 7th, not coincidentally the anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Gosar described the election of Joe Biden as a coup. Be ready to defend the Constitution and the White House. Gosar described Alexander as a true patriot and linked to Alexander's account at least 23 times since November 30th, 2020. Here's Gosar and Alexander together at a Stop the Steal rally in Arizona on December 19th. Gosar was present when Alexander said, we're going to convince them to not certify the vote on January 6th by marching hundreds of thousands, if not millions of patriots to sit their butts in DC and close that city down, right? 
And if we have to explore other options after that, yet. Yet. It seems clear in context that these other options contemplated the use of force. And three days later, on December 22nd, Gosar met with President Trump along with Brooks, Biggs, and others. He tweeted that Biden had committed sedition and that he could never, quote, accept disenfranchisement of those who voted for Trump. This sedition will be stopped. And at 12.05 p.m. on the day of the Capitol riots, Gosar tweeted that Biden should concede. I want his concession on my desk tomorrow morning. Don't make me come over there. Is this a threat of force? It probably depends, because it always depends. We'd also say that the sentence, don't make me come over there, is just Gosar saying he's going to vote to overturn the election. During the attack, Gosar used his Twitter account to call for peaceful protests, but used his parlor account to share a picture of rioters climbing the walls. Americans are upset, he said. These words don't quite condone violence, but they do imply that Gosar is on their side, and Gosar's own brother and other members of his family condemn him as a propagandist who committed sedition and treason, and they ask that he be removed from Congress. You're just as guilty as the mob that you besieged and took and um, overran uh, the, the house. And that takes us to stooge number two, Mo Brooks. Alexander also said he worked with Alabama representative Mo Brooks. Brooks was the first person to announce that he would challenge the electoral college when Congress met to count the votes on January 6th. I have a choice. I can either sit back and surrender and be a part of the surrender caucus, or I can fight for our country. Brooks rallied support for this maneuver, and the process of challenging the Electoral College is spelled out in the Constitution, so that's not a crime. However, Brooks knew that this challenge would fail because there would not be enough people in the House who would vote to overturn the election. But nevertheless, Brooks appeared at the rally where he spoke directly to the rioters who would later storm the Capitol. Did he contemplate the use of force? Today is the day American patriots start taking down names and kicking ass. Now our ancestors sacrificed their blood, their sweat, their tears, their fortunes, and sometimes their lives to give us, their descendants, an America that is the greatest nation in world history. So I have a question for you. Are you willing to do the same? My answer is yes. Louder, are you willing to do what it takes to fight for America? Louder, will you fight for America? Now, Brooks doesn't say fight comps or trespass or kill, but what is he asking people to do in this context? It seems like spill blood like their ancestors. The, now, these words might be considered hyperbole, which is protected speech, but the problem with Brooks' words is that he was telling people to fight for an outcome that he already knew couldn't happen, and that directly incited people going to the Capitol and storming it. And speaking of advocating for violence, let's talk about Don Jr. and Rudy. During the January 6th event, many speakers used incendiary language and encouraged the crowd to fight. These words included specific references to members of Congress. Donald Trump Jr. targeted Congress members who were not willing to object to certification, saying, If you're going to be the zero and not the hero, we're coming for you and we're going to have a good time doing it. Does this contemplate the use of force? Well, in comparison, Rudy Giuliani proposed, quote, trial by combat. Let's have trial by combat. And actively sought to delay certification of the election. And Giuliani, who's famous for not actually knowing how to use a cell phone, left a phone message meant for Alabama Senator Tuberville saying that they needed a reason to delay the vote so that they could present evidence of voter fraud the next day. I'm calling it because I want to discuss with you how they're trying to rush this hearing and how we need you, our Republican friends, to try to just slow it down so we can, we can get these legislatures to get more information to you. But it, 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 the only strategy we can follow is to object to numerous states and raise issues so that we get ourselves into tomorrow 
ideally until the end of tomorrow. At this point, Rudy knew that the vote would be confirmed by the House and Senate. He knew that there was no place left to present voter fraud claims. He had pressed his claims in court, in ad hoc meetings with rogue legislators around the country, and at a lawn care company in Philadelphia. Now, a prosecutor could ask a jury to infer that Rudy had no intention of presenting new evidence of voter fraud on January 7th, and that, in fact, Rudy was actually aware of and encouraging Trump's followers to storm the Capitol to stop the voters, we put it, get ourselves into tomorrow. Crew, Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, characterized this as evidence that, quote, Trump and his associates were engaged in a conspiracy with a common goal of preventing, hindering, or delaying Congress's counting and certification of the electoral votes cast in the 2020 presidential election. Now, we don't know whether Trump Jr. or Rudy had direct contacts with rioters. However, Don Jr.'s girlfriend, Kimberly Guilfoyle, allegedly spoke with Alexander on January 5th, informing him that Trump was in, quote, fighter mode. And by the way, people are asking a lot of great questions about the legal issues that are happening in Washington, D.C. these days. So there are a lot more legal eagles, but only a small percentage of the people that watch these videos are actually subscribed. So if you enjoy this analysis, please hit subscribe. Pika! <laughs> But back to Ali Alexander and all of the connections he had to various representatives. One of those representatives is Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is a famous QAnon believer. Alexander responded to one of her tweets by claiming that Congress was trying to stop objections to the electoral vote. Alexander's response was about 1776. If they do this, everyone can guess what me and 500,000 others will do to that building. Alexander tweeted on December 30th, 1776 is always an option. And Marjorie Taylor Greene tweeted 1776 on the day of the attack. Could we argue that Green was attempting to aid the rioters or even overthrow the government? It, possibly. It always depends. And it's always complicated. Though Green already has a history of threatening violence. In a Facebook post from 2018, Green wrote that House Speaker Nancy Pelosi was guilty of treason. Green argued that Pelosi should be executed. When Pelosi came out against Trump's border wall, Green made a second Facebook post claiming that Pelosi committed treason, which she pointed out is, quote, a crime punishable by death. Now, these tweets alone are incredibly unlikely to give rise to any kind of sedition indictment. For a tweet to be actionable, you'd need much more than that. You'd need a direct link between the representative tweeting it and potentially aiding the Capitol rioters. Something like what Lauren Boebert did. Republican Representative Lauren Boebert of Colorado tweeted Nancy Pelosi's whereabouts while the attack unfolded. Boebert is also affiliated with a QAnon conspiracy movement, to the surprise of absolutely no one. And during the attack, Boebert tweeted that Pelosi had been, quote, removed from the House chambers while rioters were still in the building. Boebert did not say where Pelosi was, but rioters did make it into Pelosi's office. This tweet was so ill-advised, and the strategic value to someone who is looking for Nancy Pelosi to kidnap and potentially kill her, given that it was so obvious, some wonder if Boebert actually intended for this tweet to be public, or if she meant to send it privately to someone else. But if the intent is there, if she did intend this tweet to aid uh, the Capitol rioters to actually kidnap and potentially harm Nancy Pelosi, even if it didn't actually happen, that certainly could give rise to a sedition claim. So finally, that takes us to the Tweedledee and Tweedledum of this whole election objection affair, the kings of this confederacy of dunces. I'm of course talking about Senators Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley. Members of Congress swear an oath to protect and defend the Constitution, which establishes a Republican form of government. And unfortunately, many Republican lawmakers made repeated false allegations about the elections, uh, filed many meritless lawsuits, or at least encouraged those meritless lawsuits, and of course, filed objections to the election in Congress itself. And in the Senate, Hawley struck first, claiming that he was speaking for all of Trump's voters in vowing to object to the election results. Ted Cruz formulated a similar response, but with a twist. Cruz proposed a 10-day investigation into voter fraud before certifying the Electoral College result. The reason Cruz and Hawley's actions struck a nerve is because they were both Ivy League trained lawyers who obviously know their legal claims have no validity in law. The Constitution doesn't allow for a delay in the inauguration, which has to happen on January 20th at noon. And after the attack, Cruz and Hawley did not back down. Their hometown newspapers even called for Hawley and Cruz to resign or be expelled from Congress. 
Now, in fairness, and I realize this is an incredibly low bar, but it seems that neither Hawley nor Cruz ever advocated the use of violence to overturn the election. So let's assume that sedition and treason are out the window. Is there anything else that can be done to punish Hawley and Cruz for their despicable behavior with respect to the election? Well, a lot of people have been talking about expulsion. And expulsion is a thing that Congress can do. Expulsion is the process by which a House of Congress may remove one of its members after the member has been duly elected and seated. There are two sections of the Constitution which authorize expulsion. Article 1, Section 5, Clause 2 states each House may determine the rules of its proceedings, punish its members for disorderly behavior, and with a concurrence of two-thirds, expel a member. The expulsion clause is interpreted broadly, giving each House of Congress significant discretion to decide the grounds for expelling their members. Courts give Congress wide latitude to make their own rules. And as a result, courts generally have declined to adjudicate the standards by which the House and Senate have fashioned to deal with their colleagues. But historically, 20 members of Congress have been expelled without being convicted of crimes in a court of law. Five in the House and 15 in the Senate. Now, most of those expulsions dealt with actions taken uh, leading up to the Civil War, but more recent expulsions dealt with members of Congress who had been convicted of public corruption. So there's actually precedent for expelling members for being disloyal to the United States. And by the way, the history of Congress expelling its own members is fascinating. I don't have the time or inclination to go over it right now because I'm already losing my grip on sanity because of this overlong video, but I'd highly recommend you check out my friends at the podcast opening arguments. They did an entire episode episode on Congress expelling its own members, and it's really, really incredibly interesting. And speaking about the aftermath of the Civil War, a lot of people have been talking about the 14th Amendment as well. And specifically, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment says that no person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of the president and vice president or hold any office who shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same and given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. But Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each house, remove such disability. So, to the extent that any of these members of Congress are actually adjudicated to have committed the crime of sedition, arguably a reading of the 14th Amendment says that they cannot serve in that House of Congress anymore. But I think we can all agree now that QAnon has been proven again to be an insanely stupid conspiracy theory that everyone that participated in the riots should be out of a job, and hopefully even the politicians. But they could all benefit from Emma Gannon's Skillshare class, Discovering Success, Seven Exercises to Uncover Your Purpose, Passion, and Path. They'll need a new business and a new passion because their QAnon purpose was a lie. And since they were all dumb enough to live stream themselves storming the Capitol, I know for a fact that they're dumb and can't shoot selfies for anything. So they'd also benefit from Jessica Kobezi's Skillshare class, portrait photography, shoot and edit Instagram worthy shots, because the stuff that was on Instagram deserves to be in jail. Skillshare, as I'm sure you know, is one of the world's largest online learning communities and has tens of thousands of classes on everything like business, creative writing, music, and productivity. Everything the ex-QAnon cult member needs. And the first 1,000 Legal Eagles will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium when you click on the link in the description, and you can watch all of the videos. Plus, after the trial ends, Skillshare is still way more affordable than most online learning platforms with plans starting at just $10 per month. So just click on the link below in the description and get a free trial membership of Skillshare. Plus clicking on that link in the description really helps out this channel. But do you agree with my analysis? Leave your objections in the comments, which I will either sustain or overrule. And check out this playlist over here with all of my other real law reviews where I tackle the legal issues of the day from this friggin' administration. And as always, I'll see you in court.